So we're at the, the last Sunday of our series, The Perfect Christmas Party. We've lit all four candles of our Advent wreath. And as we look forward to Christmas, we remember that the, the Sundays of Advent are just the Sundays that um, remind us that Jesus is coming towards us. So the text that we're going to read for this last Sunday is from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will, excuse me, that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host uh, appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. This is God's word. So as I said, the, the series that we are going through is a series for Advent, which is just the Latin word adwenio, which literally means to come towards. Remembering that all of the Bible, really, but particularly at the time of Advent, we focus on the fact that Christianity is about God coming towards us. It is not our accomplishments, but God's accomplishments. Not our perfection, but God's perfection. Not our ability to get better, but God's ability to be good in our place. Not our ability to come to God, but God's ability to come to us and save us. That's what Advent is all about, and it's really what the whole Bible is all about. And so for the last Sunday of Advent, we light the fourth of our candles, which is the angel candle. When I was growing up, we always knew which presents were wrapped by my dad. See, my dad is really good at wrapping presents. They were perfectly wrapped. Not a piece of paper was out of place. But the thing that reminded us that they were from dad was that they were wrapped in newspaper. My dad is a wonderfully pragmatic fellow. I remember him once saying to me, why would I buy paper that people are just going to rip anyways when I have this newspaper here? And if you think I'm making fun of my dad, you shouldn't because I now wrap my presents in newspaper. Uh, but I realize that, that for many of you, the idea of wrapping a present in newspaper gives you cold sweats uh, because you realize something that most of the world, besides me and my dad, I suppose, realize. That is that the decorations matter. The type of decorations you put on a present matter. Obviously, what the present is is what matters the most, but but that thick, good wrapping paper, a bow that you tied with your own hands, not one you just stuck on the top, that makes a difference, right? It signals to a person that this present is special. This present maybe is the one you want to wait till last to open. And God knows that too. As he plans the perfect Christmas party, he set out for us the time, the location, the guest list, and now he sets out the decorations. The things that signal what kind of celebration this is going to be. We all do this at Christmas time, don't we? We buy all sorts of things that do really nothing but signal that it's a special time. We buy Christmas lights that I swear you could like, buy your own sleep number bed for your Christmas lights and you could lay them on that sleep number bed for the entire year and then when you pick them up next Christmas, they wouldn't work, right? Isn't that what Christmas lights do? Some of us are literally going to cut down foliage to celebrate Christmas. Others of us will get fake versions of foliage and find space in our basements to store them for 11 months of the year just so that we can celebrate Christmas. There's a lot that goes into signaling that this is a special time of year. And God is no different. He sets up decorations around his Christmas story so that we can find out what kind of party this is going to be. You think about it, God could have gone pragmatic and simple, the effective newspaper wrapping of spiritual messaging. He could have done what he had been doing for the last literally couple thousands of years by sending prophets, right? He could have sent a prophet who said, the Savior is born in Bethlehem, but this Christmas he sent the angels. Those were the decorations he chose for that first Christmas night. And so what I want to do today is I want to focus on three aspects of those angels. First of all, who they were. Second of all, what the one angel who shows up first says to the shepherds, and then finally, what all the angels together say to the shepherds. So those three things. Who are they? What does the one angel say? And then what does uh, the group of angels say? The text starts this way. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, 
keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Uh, You heard like what I said to the kids, that an angel that we think of in North America is probably not a good representation of an angel. It it actually terrifies people. Uh, These angels, you can look it up. I've mentioned this before in the book of Ezekiel, in the book of Revelation. They They are amazing beings that well, they even defy some of our logic. Is that exactly what those shepherds saw that night? I don't know, but I know that they were terrified. I know that the presence of those angels made their night uncomfortable. Uh, likely, they fell down on the ground, as everyone does when they see an angel. But I want to focus on one thing maybe bigger than just what the angels look like. I want to talk about how God talks about them. Later in the text, he says that suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with that angel. You know what a heavenly host is? If you know the answer, you can put it in the chat box, and if you get it right before I say it, I don't know, we'll give you a prize or something like this. Um, I think when most people think of a heavenly host, they think of like the person who's putting on the party, right? That's a host. Or maybe they think in this context, it's like a huge group of them, like lots of That's maybe a host. Actually, the word host is very specific. It's a technical term. It's a technical term for an army. In the same way that we have things like platoons or battalions in our army, God has a technical term that he uses to talk about his angel army. He calls them a host. So you got to think about this. Like God is sending in his divine military his divine black ops officers, to bring this message to those shepherds. I don't know exactly what those angels looked like, but maybe they looked like scary military men, like barrel-chested, a little bit uncomfortably tall, with beards that come down. Like, I don't even know what they look like, but maybe they were just the manliest of angels you've ever seen. Or maybe they looked just totally ripped and skillful, like they knew how to do whatever needed to be done Maybe you know a little bit of that if you know military people. We have a couple of them in our congregation. And even if they're not an active duty, you know military people are a special breed. Their dedication, their willingness to sacrifice, their faithfulness, the way that they talk, it shows a, a certain level of character that not many people have. In many ways, military people are the best of us, aren't they? So what about God's military angels? That's the image God wants us to have in our minds as we think about the decorations of Christmas. Which, if I'm honest to you, with you, is not what I see when I look out at Christmas today. I see a lot of twinkly soft lights and cozy sweaters and soft Christmas music and sappy Christmas movies and lots of eggnog. And none of those things are inherently bad, but do they fit with how God decorated the Christmas night? And if not, why not? The military shows up in only a couple of situations. The military shows up, obviously, when there's extreme violence, whether somebody needs to be protected or somebody needs to be attacked. And they'll also show up at times of extreme disaster, whether it's a rescue effort or a cleanup effort. The military will often show up then. But is that what we see when we think about Christmas today? I would guess not. But if we're honest with ourselves, that is really what is happening around us, isn't it? There is extreme violence and great disasters happening all around us. Think about this. like Parents get cancer and die. Grandparents are neglected in long-term care homes. Children are funneled through the system instead of being raised by their biological parents. Some children don't even get to be born before their parents decide they don't want them. Rich people take advantage of poor people. Injustice abounds. Depression, suicide, anxiety are on the rise. Physical, mental, spiritual, sexual abuse. It happens all around us, doesn't it? I mean, there's not a war on our soil right now, but the effects, if we're willing to see them, Make it seem like there might be. It's almost like we need God's divine military. But why don't we see it? Why don't we notice that? 
I think there's probably a practical reason. In general, North Americans don't like to show weakness. We don't like to talk about the bad things that are happening in our lives. I don't know how many Bible studies I've been in as a pastor where it's, the question has been something like, you know, share the struggle that's going on in your life. And the level of struggle that gets shared is pretty low. But I think there's maybe a spiritual reason. Satan loves to work where we don't notice him. Satan would love if we would just turn on another Netflix program and not worry about the problems of the world. Satan would love if we would just push the responsibility off to somebody else and say, they need to take care of it, rather than actually do something about it ourselves. That's the temptation Satan has for us, which is why God needs to send in the divine military. We are not only the problem, but we are incapable of solving the problem. Our sin brings all sorts of evil into the world, and we are incapable of fixing it. As much as we would like to believe that another policy or politician or protest or post is what's going to change things and make them better, that doesn't work. And in the same way, there are some specific situations where the military needs to come in. God sends his divine military to decorate that Christmas night. But there's one other reason why the military will show up. And that's to celebrate. Whether it's uh, RCMP mounted police riding in a parade, 21 gun salutes or flyovers at sporting events, you know that the military can also show up when there are times of great celebration. And while it is definitely true that our story is one of messed up people who need saving, on this night the military came with an even better purpose, to preach. Let's look at what they said. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So he starts by saying that he brings good news of great joy for all people. Uh, That word good news in Greek is the word oiangelion which is where we get our English word evangelism. Uh, Oyangelion, though, was a very technical term. It was a term for the one person who would come back and give the message of the war. So you can picture this. This is a, a culture where they don't have things like phones or cameras. They don't know how battles are going when all their men go out to war. And so what they're waiting for, if they're waiting in the city, is for the Oyangelion, the good news. The one man who comes back, who's designated from the army to run to the city and say, we won, everybody celebrate, or we lost, everybody run for the hills. That's what that angel was doing on that night. He was the one member of the military who was called to bring the oiangelion, the good news that the battle was won. That the results of the fight, the victory that was won by that army was given to the people who didn't participate in the fight. But instead of it being an army who was at battle, it was God against evil. And by bringing his son into the world, he started an unstoppable force that would eventually destroy Satan's power. The good news was this. Evil's days were numbered. Victory for us was inevitable. And it was because of the Savior The Savior Jesus who was brought into the world. Now, saviors come when we can't save ourselves, right? When they have to clean up a mess that we can't clean up ourselves. That's who Jesus was. To be the one who could take our sin away from us because no matter how hard we try, we can't get rid of it. And that Savior was born a human being. Not an idea, not a philosophy, not a set of rules that we had to live out. Not a guru to tell us how to get to God, but part of humanity in order to drag all of humanity with him into God's gospel, his oiangelion. That human being, Jesus, who was born in that manger, eternally bound himself to humanity so that even now as Jesus has risen and ascended and at the right hand of God, he still bears his human flesh so that we can know that our eternity is tied to heaven. He was born to you, to you watching this live stream, wherever you are, to those shepherds on that first Christmas night, to you. 
not just generally for humanity, but for you. You who's messed up, you who's made mistakes, you who has guilt or shame, who is a person of no significance to most of the world, God sent this Savior to you. That Savior is the Messiah. Messiah is just a Hebrew word that means the same thing as Christ. It means the anointed one, the one whom God had prophesied, who, all, uh, who came through uh, the line of David to be the Savior of the world. In other words, God's plan, his perfect Christmas party of over 2,000 years of planning was coming to fruition in this guy. And he wasn't just from God, he also was the Lord. He was God. God and man, together in one person, to be a savior for all humanity. That was the good news. That despite how bad the world may seem out there and how much of a role we've played in it, there is a Savior who forgives sins and makes things right. There is a Savior who will clean up all the messes. A Savior who will make right all the wrongs. A Savior who would grow up and die so that we would never have to die. That's the good news. But he doesn't stop there. He then continues by saying, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. See, there were two parts to what that angel said. The first part was, listen to this. This is the preaching. This is the message. This is the oiangelion, the good news. There's a Savior who's born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord. But then there was a second part to his message. And that was, go physically be with that message. Go find it. Go seek it out. Go be with it. See, it wasn't enough for that angel to just preach this message of the Savior to those shepherds on that first Christmas night. He wanted them to physically be there and experience it. And the thing is, that's what we still preach today. Unfortunately, a lot of Christianity has gone to one or the other extreme. On the one hand, you'll find a lot of Christianity that will say, what matters is the preaching. What matters is the message. What matters is the word. Not so much the signs or the physical presence of God in the sacraments which Jesus has instituted. On the other hand, you'll have much of Christianity that says, what doesn't matter so much is the preaching, but you have to make sure you observe the sacraments in order to get right with God. But one of the beautiful things about being Lutheran is that we have both. We hear both of the words of the angel on that first Christmas night. Listen to this and then go physically be with that. That's why I'm up here preaching to you, giving you this message in words that you can be saved. But then also giving the Lord's Supper to the members of our congregation, so that they can be physically connected to Jesus through his body and blood, which is present in the Lord's Supper. And what a beautiful thing that has been the last couple of weeks. Even though it's inconvenient, even though it's out of the way for some people, we've had a number of members of our congregation take the time to physically be with Jesus in the way that he says he will be with us. I actually have had to do seven communion services this week. God be praised for that. I wonder, though, if some of you haven't heard the second part of that message. You're all in on hearing about Jesus and hearing the story and hearing the gospel, and that's awesome. But I want you to take that next step. To go physically be with Jesus. To take the Lord's Supper. To have his body and blood, his immortality, go into your mortality. So that you can get both the preaching and the physical presence of Jesus. But there's one last part to this, and that's what the angel host says. So suddenly the angel host all appears, right? And they're praising God and they're saying this, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Let's pull this apart. First of all, glory to God. When you think of God, what do you think? When you think of God, what do you feel? Do you breathe a little bit easier? Does the tension go out of your shoulders? 
Do you blink your eyes slowly, sit back in your chair, and relax? Do all of the problems that are around you just seem to melt away when you think about God and His glory? If not, I wonder if you don't know about God's glory. See, one of the things I think is a struggle for a lot of Christians is to remember that we're not just saved from something, we're saved for something. Now, the saved from part is important. We're saved from death and sin and the devil because of Jesus' death on the cross. And we preach that message with all of our might. But what sometimes we forget is that there is something we are saved for. We're saved from that for the glory of God. To be with God, to experience God, to know God, to see his glory and let it overwhelm every problem that we have. Now, not only does the Bible teach this and give this to us as a promise that not only is our eternity going to be taken care of, but even right now we can experience that eternal life as it starts and grows to that eternity. Not only can we experience those things, but we can see them start to actually change the way that we live. I read an interesting quote this week from Dr. Dale Archer. He said that if I could find a way to package and dispense hope, I would have a pill more powerful than any antidepressant on the market. I heard that quote, and I thought that must be hyperbole. (laughs) And so I did some really dry reading in some academic journals, and it turns out he's right. He turns, it turns out that having hope, in other words, a for sure future, a promise that everything that you are going to get is certain, or even a lesser version of that, like a strong sense that it's going to happen, that can actually change the way that you live right now. Uh, in the research that I read, it was connected to things like better academic performance, better athletic performance, better mood and things like a breaking of anxiety or depression in some people's hearts. What a crazy thing. Like, what if we would believe in the glory of God? That God, who created all things and sustains all things, is so perfect and so lovely and so captivating that that anything else in this world does not compare to him. He's so powerful and so in control that nothing that happens in your life goes without his notice that that God was so in love with you that he gave his son to die for you. And how would he not also give you all things along with that? That glory of God is what the angels announced. That we're not just looking forward to God someday, but we have God right now. And I know I've said this a number of times, but it's a thought that just explodes in my heart every time I think it, so I have to share it with you. You're immortal right now. Like your eternal life has started. Someday this body will breathe its last, but you'll just continue on and this body will be reformed for you and given back to you in the new heavens and new earth where you will live forever. You will not die, but live. And you're in that right now. That's not all the angels said. They said, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Which is something most people don't have today, right? whether we're worried about politics or coronavirus or things that are far more personal, whether it's finances or family, whether it's your marriage that's falling apart or the marriage that you hope you have, if it's the job that you wish you had or the job that you wish you could quit, it's a whole lot of well, unpeaceful people right now. But the angel says that this coming of Jesus will be peace on earth. Because those people who know Jesus, who hear Jesus, who see him and experience him, will know that there is something far bigger than this world, something far bigger than whatever problem is facing you today that has been given to you and is absolutely certain. To illustrate this, when I was watching TV this week, I stumbled across the Back to the Future series. Remember these movies? 1985, Marty McFly and Doc Brown, they have a time machine that they travel back and forth in time. If you watch those series, you know they kind of get progressively worse as they go. Um, But there's a moment in the second of those Back to to the Future movies that I think was just so powerful for me this week. Uh, Without spoiling the whole of the narrative, uh, the antagonist of the story, Biff Tannen, 
uh, is in the future and gets an almanac that tells all of the sports results from the past 50 years. And he actually steals the time machine, goes back in history, and gives this almanac with all of the sports scores to a younger version of himself. And that younger version of himself then bets on game after game after game and wins billions of dollars because he knows the outcome. You have something far better than that. You have something that's not going to win you a couple million or billion dollars, but is going to win you eternity with God. And it is far more certain than a sports almanac from a time-traveling DeLorean. It's the word of the eternal God given to you through angels, through your pastor, through other Christians, that tells you that this is your certain future. You will be with God. Nothing can take that away from you. So hear the message of those angels. Those black ops soldiers who came that day not to fight because the battle was won, but to give you the message that no matter how bad this world gets or how bad your life gets, God and you are okay. And I pray that you look forward to that glory of God that you will experience every time you take the Lord's Supper and ultimately fully in the everlasting life that he has promised to us. Those are the decorations that God decided to put in place at his Christmas party. What kind of party do you think it will be? Well, you'll have to find out. Join us on Christmas Eve as we finish this series with the gift that God gave us. Let's pray. God, thank you for sending the angels on that first Christmas night to signal to us that this was a message of the battle being won. That because Jesus came into the world, the inevitable was going to happen. That you were going to make good on your promises and save sinners like us. Promise us glory forever with you. Pray that you would bring your glory into our hearts by the power of your word and the power of your sacrament. That we can know that with certainty. We also ask that you would bring many people to hear this message on Christmas Eve. As we go out and ask people if they'd be willing to join us, even online, to worship, we ask that you would soften their hearts to that message. They would join us, hear this gospel, and that they would be saved. We ask all these things.